I'm a member of the philosophy department here and the humanities program and the director of the humanities forum. The purpose of this forum is to provide a place most Friday afternoons during the academic year when we can come together as a community and think about some of the deepest of human things. It's meant to provide a space, hopefully, where people from across campus can come together and consider these things as a community. The forum is also integrated as much as it can be with the timeline of the DWC program. I expect that some of you in the room uh, are thinking about the French Revolution right now, for example, which is fitting uh, given today's topic. Our guest, too, is also a bit of a, a postponed guest. He was supposed to come last year and was snowed out. Uh, there was a special group of faculty and students who were reading Edmund Burke last year, and he was part of that special gathering. We're very happy that we were able to bring him back today, and I know some of you uh, were part of those discussions last year. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor this afternoon, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Nelson. Dr. Nelson is executive director and CEO of the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal, which he co-founded with Annette Kirk in 1995. Prior to that, he spent the better part of three decades as a senior officer at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, most recently serving as the Institute's chief academic officer. He holds a BA from the University of Detroit, an MA from Yale University Divinity School, and a PhD in American history from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. For 10 years, he edited the Intercollegiate Review, the University Bookman, and was founding editor and publisher of ISI Books. In connection with this, by the way, there was for many years a tradition uh, that anyone who visited ISI's headquarters in Delaware would receive a tour of the building, and uh, after the, at the end of the tour, they'd be told, well, you can take as many books away with you as you can carry. Only one trip, as I recall, to the car. Uh, I mention that to all of you as maybe an inspiration for some of you to take a trip down there and see if it's still the case. Dr. Nelson was also president of the Thomas More College of Liberal Arts. He's treasurer of the Edmund Burke Society of America and editorial advisor to its journal, Studies in Edmund Burke and His Time. He's the editor or co-editor of several books, including Redeeming the Time by Russell Kirk, American Conservatism and Encyclopedia, The Political Principles of Robert Taft by Russell Kirk and James McClellan, Perfect Sewing by Henry Regnery, and Remembered Past by John Lukash. Let me also add that a great part of Dr. Nelson's academic vocation has been to promote intellectual friendship on college campuses and across the academy. It's been my privilege to participate in many of those events over the year, and Jeff, let me take uh, this moment to thank you for that tremendous work and for being such a gracious model uh, to so many of us, myself included, who likewise seek the blessings of genuine intellectual community. His title this afternoon, adjusted just slightly from our advertisements, is Edmund Burke in the Making of an Anti-Revolutionary Mind. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Jeff Nelson. All right, thanks everybody for coming out on a Friday afternoon to talk about Edmund Burke, which uh, on most college campuses is a slightly subversive thing to do, to talk about Burke, but I'm glad not here at uh, Providence College. Uh, I want to thank Raymond, of course, for the invitation, uh, and uh, <clears throat> Patrick uh, McFarland, Jim Keating, uh, for Pamela Belcher uh, helping me get here. Uh, Raymond's very kind words about uh, our, our, our time together in seminars and conferences. Actually, I owe him a big debt of uh, gratitude for one of our uh, conferences that we had just before COVID. COVID had broke out, and we were having it here at the Biltmore. And Glenn Lowry, the fame, uh, prominent now um, black economist, and uh, was talking uh, on race. Uh, at a seminar uh, as race and, and, and human liberty. And uh, after the first day, called and said, uh, guess what, I tested positive. I'm not coming back to the seminar. We had half the conference to go and we had no discussion leader. Our leader was gone. However, we did have Raymond in the audience uh, as one of the participants, I should say. And Raymond uh, pitched in, uh, took over, 
and uh, and guided the rest of the conference uh, and and it was great. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we didn't eat indoors that day, but we had pizza out along the in the shadow of the uh, of the of the dome <coughs> of the Capitol Dome, and uh, it turned out to be uh, a saved conference thanks to Raymond Haynes. So, a public thanks there. It was. Uh, Appreciate it, but I'm I'm not never never surprised. Raymond's been a good friend and a, is a great scholar. Um, all right. Well, yeah. I, I there, there's been a, a, a title of my talk out there and on posters, and maybe you came here under false pretenses. I don't know. Uh, the uh, I, I, doc, I gave Doctor uh, Doctor McFarland asked me for a provisional title back some months ago, or he gave me a provisional title. I said, well, let me think about it. I'll get back to you because it's not really kind of what I'm thinking about. It's just have it as a placeholder. Well. Just, it's a lesson, everybody. Placeholders often tend to become the place, the thing. Uh, so, uh, and it, 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 uh, uh, so the title's a little different, but I think given the audience and given that this is a public seminar and I'm so happy to see a lot of students who are thinking about Burke, this is gonna be, uh, I, think, I hope, much more uh, in alignment with uh, kind of where you're at and what you're thinking about as you're trying to get your mind around this guy, Edmund Burke, his significance, uh, and, the, um, and, and how he reacted to the, um, French Revolution, why it was important, and how, how did he come to be who he was to say what nobody else was saying at the time and to you know, change the direction of history in many ways, at least intellectual history and political history. So I'll, I'll be talking about uh, Burke and the making of his uh, anti-revolutionary mind. Um, much has been written about uh, Edmund Burke's response to the French Revolution and to his thoughts about the distinctive character of modern ideological politics especially about ideas aimed at radically transforming every aspect of civil social life. Burke was the first to detect something new in the air about the fanatical French proposals and the potential they had to move beyond France and alter the traditional character of Britain <clears throat> and indeed threaten the entire commonwealth of European nations. But what was it about Burke's life and thought that made him unique in first seeing the implications of the new theoretical dogma taking hold in France. After all, up until that point, Burke was known as the for foremost British friend of the American Revolution. His American speeches are quite amazing and worth reading, especially in comparison of, of his later French, French thinking. And he also waged, before then, high profile and almost solitary campaigns against imperial overreach, corruption, and abuse in India and Ireland. Um, in his, his Indian speeches where he defended the Indian natives against uh, the uh, abuses of the uh, East India Company are, again, incredible. He, he led a 10-year campaign of impeachment against the, uh, the then uh, General Warren Hastings of, uh, of India, and we get our whole tradition of understanding impeachments, which we're now familiar with, <laughs> given the last couple of presidential administrations and what's happening. Uh, from Burke, he set the precedent, that, that campaign, that long campaign on behalf of the natives, the native peoples of India, uh, uh, um, it was incredibly important up to that time. So people had a very, uh, had a particular view of Burke as a great liberal, great champion of, of rights. Uh, to many of Burke's admirers, including figures such as Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, they, uh, Paine was friendly with him, they'd met several times. Uh, to them, the publication of his reflections on the revolutionary, uh, the revolution in France uh, seemed a betrayal of his revolutionary credentials. As Jefferson wrote in a 1791 letter to the British political radical, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Vaughan, quote, the revolution of France does not astonish me so much as the revolution of Mr. Burke. I wish I could believe the latter proceeded from as pure motives as the former. Jefferson went on at some length to lament the rottenness that had taken hold in Burke's mind, that he had apostatized, in his words, from the true faith of revolution and radical Whig principles. Today we take for granted that Burke was an anti-revolutionary thinker, that's how you know him, hostile to the idea of total revolution advanced in France, but his attack on the foundation of French revolutionary thought was a seismic shock to liberals worldwide. Burke famously wrote that, quote, people will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. We live in a time when our past is being rewritten along highly charged political lines, when hallowed symbols of our history vanish with little discussion. This makes our reading Burke today seem not that distant from the French Jacobins who haunted his thoughts and occasioned his anti-revolutionary writings. Intemperate minds, left and right, 
have in every time since the French Revolution sought to re remake man and society, and today is no different. We see it before our eyes in town squares, corporate boardrooms, classrooms and curricula, church pulpits, and of course the political arena and its media and entertainment amplifiers. Burke accurately per perceived and predicted the nature of the then new radical ideology. It is often said he was a philosopher in action. It might also be said he was a historian in action, or better, a philosophical historian in action, applying lessons of the past to the great crisis and debates of his age in Britain, America, Ireland, India, and France. His writings were infused with such a profound understanding of history and the human condition that they are considered a permanent manual of political wisdom. In what follows, I will explore with you some select dimensions of Burke's anti-revolutionary mind, putting forward some themes and beliefs of his that emerge from the circumstances of his biography and his times. I'm a historian, not a political philosopher or a theorist, so you'll have to bear with me on that point. <clears throat> I hope, however, uh, that um, my approach honors Burke's own. His ideas have never been merely of antiquarian interest, and so I hope that you will also come to a better appreciate the relevancy, even the imperative, of reading Burke. All right, I have eight sections, uh, so you'll know as I get closer to eight, we're, you're, 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 you're almost done. <clears throat> Section one, Ireland's role in, fa in fashioning Burke's anti-revolutionary mind, Ireland. Ireland was the crucible of Burke's intellectual formation. <clears throat> as such, a brief overview of Burke's early experiences can shed light on his lifelong aversion to radical revolutionary thought. Burke scholar Thomas Copeland once remarked that Edmund Burke, quote, always marched at the head of a clan. Burke's clan, his extend, extended family, occupied a dominant position among the elite Catholic gentry of North County Cork. B Burke was thus raised in two Irelands, the Ireland of County Cork and the Ireland of Dublin, the capital city. The Ireland of County Cork was the disenfranchised, Gaelic, Catholic, rural, majority Ireland. The Ireland of Dublin was the ruling, English, Protestant, urban, minority Ireland. Young Burke belonged to both, an obvious source of tension. He was born in Dublin, 12 January, 1730. However, he passed his formative years principally among his mother's relatives, the Nagels, and was exposed to their Catholic gentry and Gaelic culture during the high tide of Ireland's anti-Catholic penal laws. Few Irish Catholics were immune from the force of this oppressive legislation. However, inconsistently, it was enforced and Burke's family was no exception. Like many Catholics with, ac with aspirations, it seems that Burke's father, Richard, conformed to the Church of Ireland in 1722. Families, then, often selected members to conform to the established Irish Church. For Richard, such a strategic conversion was likely made to ensure uh, success of his professional aspirations as an attorney, and importantly, to secure legally, his and his family's property, both on the Catholic and Pro Protestant side, and to provide the opportunity of advancement for his young sons. Consequently, Edmund and his brother were reared Protestant. Burke's mother, on the contrary, remained a Catholic, and according to the custom of, of the day, so did his sister, Julia. Throughout his life, Burke was closest to his mother's extended family, the Nagels, with whom he lived as a young boy in Valley Duff, County Cork. By contrast, Dublin in the 1730s was an unhealthy and smoke-clogged place. The pleasant environment of the city, and in, the unpleasant environment of the city, and in particular, Burke's house on Aaron Quay, which faced the Liffey River, goes right through Dublin. It was damp and it was cold. And uh, Mary Burke, uh, it gave Mary Burke, his mother, a chance to send her son to the land of her, her youth. Burke spent the formative years of age six to 12 uh, principally with his Nagel kin in the, in the valley of the River Blackwater, which meandered in the shadow of a mountain range named for his Nagel relatives. For Burke, Bailey Duff and the Blackwater Valley offered a healthier environment, both physically and spiritually. These were places of rest and rejuvenation, of fresh air and water, of, com uh, of conversation and conviviality, of friend and family, of hearth and history. Edmund Spencer, a relative on Burke's mother's side, lived there. Burke and his cousins would play about the ruins of Spencer's Kilcolman Castle at the foot of the Nagel Mountains, where he wrote The Fairy Queen. Indeed, Burke's clannish view of the family and his profound sense of history 
were nurtured in in the, in the Valley of the Blackwater. Burke's first truly formal and rigorous educational experience occurred when he went to Belly Duff, where he seems to have taken up his Latin grammar in a Catholic hedge school. Uh, hedge school is, is, is a, basically an outlawed school, it's just, uh, just out, outside the bounds of uh, the, the penal laws. They were literally often in hedges, little squares outside uh, uh, without roofs, but they were often, maybe even slightly more often, in, in, in rooms, discrete rooms uh, boarded. But they were always, they're termed hedge schools. You look up the hedge school, it's a fascinating chapter in, in uh, ed educational history. But he was, re uh, his, first, his first experience was in a hedge school run by an itinerant uh, schoolmaster of good repute named O'Halloran. Uh, while he ill health was the proximate reason for sending Burke to Ballet Duff, some biographers also suggest that Burke's mother may have wanted to secure Catholic grade schooling as a foundation for her son. As part of this education, an itinerant friar would have instructed Burke. Indeed, recent research suggests that the additional instruction in Burke's hedge school might have been provided by the Jacobite poet, Liam Inglis, just prior. These were Jacobites were the pro Stuarts. so again, uh, outlaws, just prior to his entering an uh, uh, Augustinian monastery in Cork, in Cork City. Burke certainly shared with his mother a religious nature, much of his early writing exhibiting a deep religious sensitivity. And it was in the hedge school, located in the ruins of Spencer's old castle, where these sensitivities were nurtured and cast for life. It must have been a lively experience for Burke on multiple levels, as he shared his early educational experiences with his first cousins, Nano Nagel, was one. Uh, she would later become foundress of the Sisters of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary and was declared venerable actually by Pope uh, Francis on uh, October 31st, 2013. They were first cousins. Along with his cousins, uh, Richard and James Hennessy, later founders of Cognac. So if you ever go and you have the opportunity to sip on Cognac Hennessy, there's deep Burkean family connections there. They were a rowdy crew, made a lot of noise in, later in London too, uh, with, with Burke, uh, Burke with the, with the newfound cognac, et cetera. So the Hennessy's were there, uh, a, a, a venerable, uh, soon to, someday to be venerable uh, foundress. So uh, it's quite, quite an amazing collection. Politically, Burke's life in Protestant Dublin would have been complicated by, his, uh, by the Jacobite sympathies of his Nagel relatives. How uniform this ten uh, tendency was within the Nagel family is uncertain. What is certain the, is that the clannish Catholicity of Burke's Blackwater Valley relatives permeated his young mind, fostering an ingrained Irish patriotism with Catholic sympathies that lasted throughout his life. Burke was a great champion of uh, uh, <clears throat> Irish Catholic relief from the 1760s to the 1780s when he actually made it happen, a lot of it. So it's very consistent. And it's also consistent in his histories, which is, we can, we can, I can really go down a rabbit hole on that one, uh, how, how different he is from David Hume on the question of Protestant Catholic interpretations of events. He's very consistently pro-Catholic. <clears throat> a second lasting uh, educational attachment, however, was uh, for him uh, a, to a Quaker boarding school that he attended just after this period in 1741. In addition to the Catholic problem in Ireland, there existed a large pro uh, population of Protestant dissenters who sided with the established church when Catholics were the objects of discrimination, but who bitterly resented their own social exclusion and limited toleration by that same Protestant establishment. The dissenting Quakers to whom Burke became so attached shared, shared a common experience with his Nagel relatives, which made this transition easier and the bonds formed stronger. The Quaker-run school at Ballator in County, Kild County Kildare, some 30 miles southwest of Dublin, was set again in a serene and idyllic county. The academic atm atmosphere was serious and benefited from an ecumenical collection of students from well-born families. Its founder and guiding light, Abraham Shackleton, was a self-taught Latinist who had come to Ireland from Yorkshire as an educational missionary. Initially a family tutor, <coughs> he founded his academy at Ballator 15 years prior to Burke's admission. The curriculum is rigorous, religious, and classically humanist. The Bible and Latin were the centerpieces, and it was left to Shackleton's discretion which of the heathen authors uh, he deems suitable for study. Burke's uh, later oratory uh, uh, writings and politics are, man are, in fact, manifestations of an Anglo-Irish religious humanism that was forged in him from this time. At an early age, Burke inherited the classical, medieval, and Renaissance humanists he read, Isocrates, Demosthenes, Cicero, Moore, Erasmus, Bacon, long list <coughs> of names that you and, you and this program would be familiar with. And, and uh, to an explicit commitment to the artist liberalis or studia humanitates tradition. 
with its emphasis on human refinement, moral instruction of the good citizen, and ultimately the cultivation of intelligence, conscience, and grace. Burke's politics were to be fundamentally literary, as we'll see, poetical, moral, and historical. Through his mastery of various disciplines, he came to appreciate that there are other modes of knowledge, at least as instructive as reason. The humanism which Burke discovered and made his own at Shackleton School and afterward at Trinity College in Dublin was characterized by the belief that art, writing, and speaking, aesthetics, which we'll talk about in a minute, and rhetoric, had a social and moral dimension or responsibility. The contention that rhetoric and philosophy must not be separated, the conviction that an individual had a duty to serve the public good, and the understanding that there must exist always a balance between the theoretical and the practical aspects of what the ancients called wisdom and the enlightenment preferred to call reason. Humanists were rhetoricians first. <clears throat> they believed in the ongoing power of words and ideas, and they saw in deliberation and debate a better means than coercion to resolve conflict. If they were contemplative, they were also active. Such was Edmund Burke. <clears throat> Burke returned to Dublin and entered Trinity, Trinity College uh, at 14 April 1744. After all these experiences I just mentioned, barely more than 14 years old <laughs> entering in college. Academically, uh, Burke's uh, ballatory reading in the oratorical tradition was advanced and deepened over the next four years. Uh, during the mid-1740s, when Burke attended uh, Trinity, the chief subject was the classics. <clears throat> Socially, though, Trinity was a less congenial uh, atmosphere or environment for Burke than was uh, ballatory. But he did form a close union with several of his friends and resulted in two important associations, which I can only mention and not really describe, but his first was the foundation of a, 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 and leadership of a prominent, at that time, college debating society known as the club. The records still exist of their, their debates uh, in, in, in the archives there. And the club is, uh, would come to be, uh, reoccur later, uh, that, that term or an association would come later in the 1760s and 80s with Dr. Johnson and Burke, became a much more famous collection of individuals later. But first, we've, we come across first the club in Trinity, his Trinity College, and second, his role in publishing a co college newspaper suggestively titled The Reformer. And this word, reformer, will recur through the, our talk. And as Burke, how he out identified himself. Remember, there was no word of conservatism. There was no, conservatism wasn't a word at a time. He never called himself that, never referred to it. That wasn't, that, that wasn't uh, part of the vocabulary until the 19th century. <clears throat> he was a reformer, and he viewed himself that uh, from the beginning in, 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 in his, his uh, his high school paper, again, the copies exist and people study, it's, it's still very, very interesting and was very engaged in both the city, uh, not just the college life, but the city life and the art, artistic intellectual milieu of, as well. So this is very highbrow paper. <clears throat> For Burke, uh, education as a means to improvement meant the improvement of existing institutions and customs, not their radical transformation or utter abandonment. In Ireland, and then soon after in his new life in London, and this for important, Burke's mind was saturated with history. His reference, po his reference point for reform was always the past and not an idealized future based on an optimistic view of man's nature and the inevitable march of progress. All right, that's a little long, but I wanted to lay the foundation there. <clears throat> we'll move, move now to uh, section two, which is on Burke's aesthetics, because Burke's aesthetics remind us of the social implications of the sublime that underpin his later revolutionary thought. And you'll see and detect and even mentions the sublime in the, in the context of the re reflections of the revolution in France. So it's important to at least to know this part of his mind because it's for formative. Uh, in 1757, at just only 27 years old, <clears throat> Burke published an extremely influential book <clears throat> entitled A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our, Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful. It enjoyed a wide readership, critical praise, and it's still generally viewed as a key text in that aspect of the Enlightenment focused on the passions and the sentiments. Others would supersede it, but it's still viewed as a central uh, text. <clears throat> um, Burke's early aesthetical thought was at least to a point inductive and empiricist. His method followed from an a priori understanding of a world designed by a, creator, by a creator, a first caused and a, fi a first and final cause, as he wrote, the more accurately we search into the human mind, the stronger traces we everywhere find of his wisdom who made it. <clears throat> this is his starting point for this aesthetics. For Burke, the sublime experience is essentially an encounter with limitedness, limitedness. 
as the sublime is characterized by terror and by degrees ultimately is traced back to the reality of pain and the cognizance of death, which Burke called the king of terrors. One of the best writers on Burke's political aesthetic, Stephen White, argues that Burke's aesthetical ideal is based on the natural and social implications of human finitude. This intense experience of limitedness gripped Burke his entire life. Of the ideas capable of making, powerful, uh, making a powerful impression on the mind, Burke re reduced them to two categories. The first was self-preservation and, and is associated with a sensation of pain or danger. Ideas of sickness, pain, death, quote, fill the mind with strong emotions of horror. Health and life give us pleasure, but are not as powerful emotions in the self-preservation of individuals. These emotions are the basis of Burke's concept of the sublime. The second powerful emotion of the mind was society or social relations and relates to the sensation of pleasure. The passions forming what he called the great chain of society were for Burke's sympathy, imitation, and ambition. Sympathy, which, which will reoccur, is a sort of substitution, he, he, he wrote, quote, by which we are put into the place of another man and affected in many respects as he is affected. The passions may turn upon ideas of self-preservation or pain and be a source of the sublime, or it may turn upon the social affections and be a source of pleasure, <clears throat> and, and thus the beautiful. It is through sympathy that poetry, painting, and other affecting arts, this is Burke, transfuse, transfuse their passions from one breast to another and are often capable of grafting a delight on wretchedness, misery, and death itself. For Burke, Passions of self-preservation and society are produced without the invention of re intervention of reason. The other important passions belonging to society, according to Burke, are imitation and ambition. Each one, quote, of the great instruments used by providence in bringing our nature towards its perfection. If sympathy aroused concern for others, for what others feel, imitation is an affection that, quote, prompts us to copy whatever they do. As such, we have a quote, pleasure in imitating. It is by imitation, far more than precept, that we learn everything. Imitation before precept is how we learn everything. Reason for Burke was a, quote, disagreeable yoke, a languid and precarious operation. Whereas in learning by imitation, quote, we, act, we acquire not only more effectually, but more pleasantly. <clears throat> However, man cannot perpetually imitate, else he would, quote, remain as the brutes do. To prevent it, God planted in, in man a sense of ambition and a satisfaction arising from the contemplation of his excelling his fellows in something deemed valuable amongst them. Ambition is what makes, quote, the idea of distinction so very pleasant in a man. The passions thus considered are what Burke used to, quote, search into the human mind and uncover, uncover the stronger traces of his wisdom who made it. In being critical of the reasoning faculty, Burke did not attempt to deny its fundamental role in perception. Rather that while reasoning, as opposed to reason, is characteristic of man, it does follow from the senses and thus should fundamentally be coupled with or tied to human experience to keep it anchored in reality, as he wrote, quote, surely it is worth taking some pains to have it just and founded on the basis of sure experience. <clears throat> this is def this defense of experience emerges here early. Such experience was more memorialized for Burke in custom, or what he described as second nature. Those socialized habits that through the give and take of time chasten and civilize us. This is one important reason why manners, as I will discuss in a, in a minute, were to be such an important element of Burke's thought. A man's sentiments are formed largely by the prevailing manners of his age and distinguish his relative civility from his primordial brutishness. It is in this way that Burke related the passions to the bonds of society. He was concerned about the problem of social affection. How does a people form tastes and affections? How do societies form and nurture the affections, and hence allegiances of people? <clears throat> how do societies form uh, uh, how the family for Burke was a nursery of such uh, affections? After that, the place of birth, religious and civic associations, and friendships were crucial. As individuals move away from these bonds, their affections grow thinner, their governing institutions more fragile, and revolutionary dreams take hold more easily. In the French Revolution, Burke would see a perverse aesthetic 
and sounded his well-known alarms. We are born into social relations, he knew, attached to what he would later refer to as the little platoon we belong to in society. Learning to love and strengthen families, friendships, and communities was the best guarantee of the beautiful experiences of social balance, health, and peace. All right, we'll move now direct, more directly into his thoughts with section three uh, and move from his aesthetics to, well, some continuity uh, and discuss his concept of the moral imagination. A refurbished moral imagination is an antidote to revolutionary thought. <clears throat> From his awareness of the role in our lives of habits and sentiments, tastes and affections, Burke came to appreciate that morality and imagination are directly related. In the context of aesthetics, they were related to this no his notion of sympathy. It is, in his context, it is in this context that Burke introduced the idea of a moral imagination. It was this faculty for Burke that connects habits, sentiments, affections, and morality with the imagination. He introduced the moral imagination in his famous passage about the character of Marie Antoinette that takes place as Burke considers how France, had how France had reached the point at which the queen could be assaulted by a mob, her own bed defiled, herself disgraced and moved to Paris where she would eventually be executed. Burke believed that this, what he called atrocious spectacle was evidence that quote, the most important of all revolutions, the most important of all revolutions a revolution in sentiments, manners, and moral opinions had taken place. <clears throat> it wasn't the political, you know, it was, it was a revolution in sentiments, manners, and moral opinions for him was the most important of the revolution. His outrage at such a humiliation is intensified by the fact that the French allowed it. As he wrote, I thought 10,000 swords must have leapt from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. However, he laments that, quote, the age of chivalry is gone. <clears throat> In its place, he wrote, that of sophisters, ec economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. The unbought grace of life, the cheap defense of nations, the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone. David Bromwich, uh, a prominent English professor and Burke scholar at Yale, has highlighted how Burke believed the cultural conditions in previous generations of French people would never have permitted them to abandon all courage and honor and allow an assault on their queen. But circumstances were transformed, and the violation of the queen and other revolutionary excesses were made possible by the deterioration of the moral conditions <clears throat> that might have prevented it. Those Burke summed up as the spirit of religion and the spirit of, of a gentleman. He said these are the two uh, moral conditions in, 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 in particular that had uh, been eroded and allowed, uh, made, paved the way for the revolution. <clears throat> the eradication of the spirit of religion and the spirit of a gentleman. These were indispensable cultural conditions to preserve order, liberty, and forestall revolution. However, once the new ideological politics took hold moving forward, he prophesied all is to be changed, quote, I mean, this is a few lines, but you get, get, maybe you've read this in your, uh, already in your uh, study of Burke, a famous passage where he says, all the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life in which by a bland assimilation incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify, which beautify and soften private society are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation, are to be exploded as, as a ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. Uh, Burke, Burke, Burke would be really right, and, you know, so, uh, right. He was considered one of the great rhetoricians and orators of his time. We talked a little bit about his young oratory, or, oratorical uh, and rhetorical education. Well, he, he puts it to famous use in, in, in the reflections, but in all his speeches are still a case study in, uh, in, in, in effective rhetorics. And in fact, we were just talking earlier, through most of the 19th into the first half of the 20th century, every school, every American schoolboy studied his speeches on America 
as texts for effective oratory <coughs> and rhetoric and inter incredible introductions by you know teachers and that was a big part of uh, everyone's education was to teach rhetoric. Uh, not so much anymore. <coughs> Maybe here, hopefully, a little bit. <coughs> anyway, um, these outrages in France were for Burke a threat to England as well as France. I mean, he's writing about the French Revolution, but he's really trying to stoke the fire back, get, get people warning in England because his own party, most of his own party is supporting the French Revolution. Oh, this is great, it's all freedom. And he's like, no, 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 it's something much, much different going on here, people, and if it comes here, we're in big trouble. Our constitutional tradition is really, you know, uh, uh, fragile <coughs> as it is. And so what he's doing is warning not so much the French, but the British, it's part, that's what's going on here. And by extension, all of Europe. <coughs> so he didn't want the fire to spread. Uh, he defended the British constitutional order uh, with its roots extending from Magna Carta and the Declaration of Rights, for it was, quote, <clears throat> uh, the result of a profound reflection. This is his thinking of tradition. The tradition of British constitutionalism was a result of a profound reflection, or rather the happy effect of following nature, their own nature, going according to the nature of the British people, which is wisdom without reflection. I always like that phrase, nature. It's a uh, wisdom without reflection. So Burke's the anti-revolutionary thinker, this habitual, customary process, wisdom without reflection, is the ideal in a healthy culture. You don't have to think about it, right? It's wisdom is, all, is there, but it's, you know, you, it's without reflection. It's a body of all our forebears, all the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears, and, the, and all the debates and, <clears throat> and haggling and whatever that's sort of led to the making of the Constitution, just like our own constitutional tradition. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of wisdom without reflection. So you gotta take this, you gotta be careful here where we, how we tread. <clears throat> so now he's working himself up and a lot, a lot of us with him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for Burke, the anti-revolutionary uh, anti thinker, this hab habitual customary process is the idea of a healthy functioning culture. Thinkers in the line of Burke has sought to harness the power of the imagination for moral ends. Irving Babbitt, uh, uh, er Russell Kirk, We'll mention some more. T.S. Eliot, the famous poet, understood after Burke that the imagination can be both a moral and a disruptive force. We want to be other, but, it, but it's powerful either way. Napoleon famously said, imagination rules the world. I'm going to say reason. <clears throat> Rightly understood, the moral imagination is a conserving faculty and force. It is a much needed in refurbishing and reinventing in our time. It might be something to talk about at dinner. It's the, 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 the place of the imagination in our, in our current moment. And, 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 and looking at ways in which uh, <coughs> there's, there's so many people working in the arts and <coughs> across the spectrum and uh, reviving a sort of a, an idea of the, the centrality, the imagination and uh, aesthetics. And uh, so that's kind of an interesting area and, they're and, and uh, many of them are drawing on Burke. Uh, all right, fourth, fourth as we make the turn here. Um, Burke's anti-revolutionary anti thought depends on a healthy tradition of manners. We mentioned this uh, er earlier, I mentioned the primacy of the imagination and of affections and relationships extends both to, to the nation and to a revitalized Anglo-European civilization. They are a crucial foundation for his case against French revolutionary thought. And while the economic and political ties that bound Europe together in a community of interest is central to Burke's notion of a common Europe, an even more foundational glue, is, uh, glue as we mentioned, and he argues in the reflections, is the, quote, ancient system of opinion and sentiment that he conceptualized as manners. The system of Europe, or the European system as Burke called it, was united by a common Christian culture. He quote, the similitude of religion, laws, and manners is how he described Europe. Burke viewed the aggregate of nations in Europe as one commonwealth, in that it is, quote, virtually one great state with a shared source for its structures of government, economy, and education. He held that from older notions of chivalry that flourished in the feudal Middle Ages, a code, of a code uh, or tradition of manners developed which, quote, softened, blended, and harmonized the colors of the whole. Manners were the foundation for a society's unwritten uh, or, or uncodified constitution, <clears throat> and they set the social boundaries or expectations for behavior. As such, they cannot be created or legislated. For Burke, who was a lawyer, or he studied law. Uh, for Burke, a uh, student of both history and laws, he said manners are, quote, what vex or soothe, corrupt or purify, exalt or debase, barbarize or refine us. The law, on the other hand, he said, touches us but here and there, 
and now and then. He always believed that manners, he wrote, this is him, are of more importance than laws. Upon them, in a great measure, the laws depend. For Burke, manners reveal themselves in the immemorial inherited patterns of tradition, custom, and prescription. Tradition, custom, and prescription. They are the basis for a nation's folkways and are visible in the everyday historical record of people. They were for Burke the font of the rights and duties that are acquired through the passage of time. In this context, he condemned the barbarous philosophy of the revolutionaries that severed all affections that might engender love for the commonwealth. He countered with a memorial flourish. He said, there ought to be a, to be a system of manners in every nation which a well-formed mind would be disposed to relish. And I love this sentence. To make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. Right. To make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. Think about that. The system of manners that develops organic, organically through history and gives color to laws in any country is not to be experimented or trifled with arrogantly through the vehicle of cold reason. They are the source of our social affections, which make, our, make us love our country, right, being lovely. Burke's aesthetic, effective categories help him to diagnose what he called the, quote, modern system of morality and policy as a cataclysmal danger. His distinction between an authentic and false sublime allowed him to conceptualize the passing age of chivalry with the dawning age of cold reason and the unrelenting undoing of boundaries and limits. This is an important element of Burke's critique of modernity. So I got the word modernity in there from Dr. McFarland. <coughs> Uh, section uh, five, um, moving through, countering the ideological revolution with the politics of prudence. This idea of the politics of prudence, very important, especially in our time. Burke's anti-revolutionary mind is evident in his defense of prudential politics and the limits of reason over ideological politics. As I mentioned at the outset, it was Burke who first introduced the notion of, an ideal, of the ideological revolution and who warned against the rise of a new kind of ideological, doctrinaire, systematic, or abstract thinker. Such a thinker had advanced highly speculative ideas with no connection to history or appreciation for the realities and complexities of human nature. He often wrote of the, quote, political men of letters, rarely adverse to innovation, and actively hostile to preservation, in which, quote, a spirit of cabal, intrigue, and proselytization pervaded all their thoughts, words, and actions. Burke hated, hated political abstractions and believed naked reason was impotent to, to design a viable social order. Tradition or accumulated social experience was a better guide than reason. Still, as Daniel Mahoney uh, argued, uh, the, quote, the abstract theorizing of the French revolutionaries and its intellectual boosters that Burke excoriated should not be confused with any contempt for truth or enduring moral principles on his part. Burke is the furthest thing from a relativist or a historicist who denies unchanging truths. In his, in his speeches against uh, Warren Hastings, and then Governor General of India, and the corruption of British imperial politics in India, Mahoney points to Burke's criticisms of what he called geographical, geographical morality, insisting rather that, quote, the laws of morality are the same everywhere. For Burke then, the ideologue or political ra ra rationalist denies all this. He is one who, in the words of uh, the conservative thinker Russell Kirk, quote, uh, thinks of politics as a revolutionary instrument for transforming society and even transforming human nature, which is uh, now the cutting edge we've come to. <clears throat> in his march toward utopia, the ideologue is merciless. We are used to thinking that ideology is just a benign word for someone's worldview. Hey, he's got, it's just his ideology. You know, ideology, very whatever, uh, <clears throat> whereas words like prudence or moderation are disparaged. Burke himself recognized this happening in the reflections even when he wrote that as the re re revolution advanced, quote, moderation will be stigmatized as the virtue of cowards and compromise as the prudence of traitors. <clears throat> so true. Far from benign, however, Burke called ideology an armed doctrine, really. Because in the end, it was the guillotine, or in killing fields, a, a gun in your head, or dragged off to the gulag in the last century, <coughs> the gas chambers, an armed doctrine. The modern ideologue ushered in the era of utopian schemes and political fanaticism. 
Through the most horrific violence, they have sought to refashion every facet of human life on the basis of their theoretical, theoretical models and reasoning. Quote, ideology in short is a political formula that promises mankind an earthly paradise, Kirk noted. But in cruel fact, what ideology has created is a series of terrestrial hells. It does so because it is an inverted religion. And this is an important point. This is Burke saw this. Most anti-ideological thinkers see that, see that the new ideological thinking is essentially a, 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 new, a false religion, an inverted religion. And it makes political compromise impossible. And it prom promulgates a version of absolute truth that is much more absolute than true. Ideologues accept no deviation from fidelity to their creeds, and so they war mercilessly and endlessly <coughs> upon one another to enforce it. The terrible revolutionary movements of the 20th century <clears throat> give grim evidence of the ongoing deadly allure of, reg of revolutionary and authoritarian movements, and authoritarian movements, authoritarian movements are on the rise again in, our, in just in the last five, six years, are beginning to rage. So this is all becoming not mere exercise of recent contemporary history, which I know for a lot of people is, may as well have been, you know, the Cold War for a lot of people now is, may as well have been the Peloponnesian War. Our memories are so short. <coughs> but it's coming back very quickly. <coughs> and we see something of that ideological intensity in our cities, on our campuses, and in our curricula these days. Burke warns us of it. He says in the reflections that as the science of government is practical and intended for such practical purposes, it requires experience, and even more experience than any person can gain in his whole life. It is thus, quote, with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon pulling down an edifice, which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purposes of society. A few la uh, la later, uh, he, uh, he, a few pages later, he adds, is it in destroying and pulling down that skill is displayed? In destroying and pulling down? Is that how we display our skill? Your mob, he said, can do this as well as at least as, least as your assemblies. The shallowest understanding, the rudest hand, is more than equal to that task. Rage and frenzy will pull down more in a half hour than prudent deliberation and foresight can build up in a hundred years. Feels very... One of the best books written on Burke's politics of prudence is Greg uh, Wiener's book called Old, uh, Old Whigs. In it, he reminds us that prudence is essentially practical wisdom, the capacity to choose the right means for attaining worthy ends. And he explains how prudence understood in this way gets a bad rap in our, a, in our time for being timidity by another name. He argues that, quote, prudence is not caution out of fear, which Burke himself called a false reptile prudence. <clears throat> But rather, Burkean prudence stems from a moral commitment to the limits of reason. Wiener points out that at times, prudence requires bold action, sometimes not. But, quote, the key to prudence, he said, is knowing the difference, having the capacity of judgment that can distinguish between the ordinary moments and genuine crisis, and in either case, calibrate actions to proper goals. Moderation, it follows for Wiener and Burke, is anchored, quote, in a moral, moral soil and intellectual humility. That's an important word, humility. As well as, quote, an intellectual recognition of the variability of circumstances. It combines principle and judgment and courage. Dan Mahoney again refers to this as tough-minded moderation. I like that phrase, tough-minded moderation. If we have to qual qualify moderation, but tough-minded moderation. Prudence, then, uh, requires the use of reason but also humility about its limits. This is increasingly important in our time because, as Wiener points out, American political life emphasizes revolutionary rhetoric more than prudence. It is a time in which all positions are stated in extremes, he said. All conflicts seem ultimate. Every election, a choice between redemption and doom. <clears throat> we, read, we read Burke, quote, to, be, to beware the rhetoric of catastrophe. Good, good reason to read him. Section six is on uh, change. Uh, Burke arguing this is an, a central point to, to, to his discussion. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this at dinner. Burke argued that change is inevitable, even desire, desirable, and is pursued through a process of preservative reform. Preservative reform. Burke perceived at the outset that the French Revolution was a total revolution, sweeping away all institutions, beliefs, and traditions that were in its way. It was a crisis not just for all of Europe, but for the West more generally. 
quote, all circumstances taken together, he wrote, the French Revolution is the most astonishing thing that has hitherto happened to the world. Burke juxtaposed revolution and reform and argued that genuine salutary change is accomplished by the reformer and not by the revolutionary. As we get back to this idea of Burke self-identifying as a reformer. It is important to note here that Burke was a circumstantial thinker, which follows from his politics of prudence. And while he believed in universal first causes and principles, he was first and foremost a particularist. Burke made this point while defending uh, the, a previous revolution, the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, with, um, which ended with the peaceful accession of William of Orange and, uh, and Mary II. He wrote, quote, circumstances, circumstances, quote, which for some gentlemen pass for nothing, given reality to every political principle, its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. The circumstances are what render every civil social scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind. Tending to circumstances and particularities lead Burke to develop a theory of social change. <clears throat> He's not some stick in the mud conservative. It's all, all, you know, the, it's all about stasis and preserving the status quo, which is a, a stereotype, <clears throat> uh, a label that uh, most conservatives, and especially Burke, uh, get. is far, far different and more complicated. Tending to circumstances, then, he develops this theory of change. While discussing, discussing different periods in British history, the Restoration, Glorious Revolution, principally, he argues, and this is a very important uh, phrase, uh, it's one of his most suggestive phrase, quote, um, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Got it? A state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. <clears throat> right? So change is qualifying conservation. That, that's the key. <clears throat> you, got, you want to conserve? It's through change. That's what he's saying in, the, in that sentence. Well, what does he mean? Okay. Seems like a, a contradiction. <clears throat> the two principles of conservation then and correction must operate strongly, he thought, if the constitution of a nature was to be preserved, balanced, and functioning. As I mentioned, conservatives are also accused of being defenders of at all costs of the status quo. This is probably true more of like more European rightists than it has been of uh, most American conservatives. American conservatives have been more decidedly Burkean, and this is in no way more manifest than this commitment to reconciling the claims of permanence and change. And this is really a fundamental conservative task, Reconciling, we're always reconciling tensions. Tensions, and <clears throat> in this case, between you know between order and liberty, and the, uh, between permanence and change. It's always the tensions where 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 con conservatives are zooming in, and trying to uh, trying to bank. So it's it's a very subtle, important um, um, uh, approach. Um, American conservatives look to the past for instruction, and may have healthy health, and we obviously have a healthy degree of nostalgia. But fundamentally, uh, they look to the past because they care about the future. There's a kind of dynamism at their core that is o often overlooked. <clears throat> to be what he called a, quote, honest reformer, to negate ideology, Burke knew was a delicate proposition. As I said, experience and prudence and discrimination were key for a mind capable of holding in balance, reconciling change and progression. Progress in society should proceed from what he called, quote, the principle of reference to antiquity. That's quite a principle, right? The principle of reference to antiquity. The prudent reformer understands that, as he puts it, quote, the idea of inheritance furnishes a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission without at all excluding, excluding a principle of improvement. Mere innovators generally are the result of self, selfish tem temper and confined, confined views. Burke, though, develops from this a theory of statesmanship that is something to be wished for in our time, I think, and which is the antithesis of the revolutionary. Now listen to Burke describe his uh, ideal statesman. He says, quote, I cannot conceive how any man can have brought himself to that pitch of presumption to consider his country as nothing but carte blanche, upon which he may scribble whatever he pleases. A man full of warm, speculative benevolence may wish his society otherwise than uh, uh, otherwise constituted than he finds it, but a good patriot and a true politician always considers how he shall make the most of the existing materials of his country. Quote, and this is the line, a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve taken together would be my standard of a statesman. 
a disposition to preserve with an ability to reform. A disposition, that's an important word, a disposition to preserve and, and the practical prudence, practical ability to reform. Always, this is his idea this year. Everything else is vulgar in the conception, perilous in the execution. <clears throat> now, this concept seems straightforward enough, but how hard is it for statesmen of any age, let alone our own, to meet this Burkean ideal? Reform, reformers and statesmen in this tradition must at once hold what Burke called the bank and capital of the ages. They must hold the bank and capital of the ages before them while harnessing the needs of the time and the power of change. As Yuval Levin put it, quote, <clears throat> the fundamental insight of Burke's positive case for reform is that a statesman ought to begin from gratitude for what works in his society rather than from outrage for what does not work. He must begin from a sense of what he has and what is worth preserving, and from there build towards what he wants and what is worth achieving. But without question, change is not only inevitable, but desirable. And without developing an effective means of change, a nation might, in Burke's words, might even risk the loss of that part of the Constitution which it wished the most religiously to preserve. If you don't have this dynamic, this, this, this view of change we're describing. You might even lose what it is you most sacredly or most passionately want to preserve. This difficult task of preservative improvement is to Burke's mind the most demanding and the most important challenge of political life. It certainly is. The remedies for social grievances are the product of a critical and creative engagement with the past that when brought to bear in the present is tempered by prudence and a spirit of caution and gradualism so as not to destroy the essential good along with the accidental evil. Burke's reformism thus embraced change and development, but with the reference point being the past, not the future. Unlike such Enlightenment thinkers as Condorcet or Voltaire, who theorized about an ideal future and views, viewed the past and present through the prism of their own time, this presentism is a very powerful thing in our own lives now. We, we, we tend to unthinkingly, I think, be presidents. We judge the past by our own, you know, by our own moment, our own prejudices at the moment. <clears throat> and this is a very, you know, kind of revolutionary thing uh, that Burke uh, rejected. <clears throat> uh, he, uh, who, the, the Condor, Condorcet and Voltaire, who theorized about an ideal future, viewed the past and present through the prism of their own utopia. Burke rejected change based on abstract theorizing, novelty, and what he called the spirit of innovation. For Burke to preserve, it was necessary to reform. He was, as the historian Ross Hoffman once noted, a reforming conservative rather than a conservative reformer. He wished to reform in order to conserve. In an age of populism, resurgent nationalism, so-called post-liberalism, progressivism for sure, a revival of this kind of conservatism I think is very much needed. <clears throat> All right, we're almost through here. The uh, uh, section seven, the recognition that liberty is never licensed is central to Burke's critique of revolution. This is a, a, big, a big issue uh, for Burke and for us. In his speech uh, at the arrival of Bristol, when, when he was elected a, um, <clears throat> a, a member of parliament uh, representing Bristol, and this is part of his American speeches, while being voted uh, for uh, an MP, Burke said, quote, in his speech, the only liberty I mean is a liberty connected with order that not only exists along with order and virtue, but which cannot exist at all without them. While detesting abuses of power of any kind, Burke's practical politics, theoretically, uh, he, uh, he, theoretically, he sought to reconcile the claims of liberty and authority against the rise of individualism to forge what he called ordered liberty. Ordered liberty. This is Burke's phrase. This is a very big phrase amongst Burke, Burkeans, conservatives, um, and, and uh, in general, uh, you know, the, the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, this, this view of ordered liberty. The American, American founders speak a lot of ordered liberty. He knew liberty to be a great good, but it needed the restraint of society in order, uh, in order for it to be salutary. He spoke as often about false freedom as about freedom rightly understood. One example of that occurs somewhat early in the reflections. He speaks of how the idea of freedom has changed with the rise of the revolutionaries. He says, here's a question, is it because liberty in the abstract may be classed among the blessings of mankind, that I am seriously to fel felicitate a, highway a highwayman and a murderer who has broke free from prison upon the recovery of his natural rights. 
Is this what we mean by liberty? Is this what we celebrate this? Liberty for Burke is a blessing, but it's not always a blessing. France, at that time, introduced a new liberty. And when this new liberty was combined with the force of government terror, the undoing of society was the result. In this regard, he argued, quote, the effect of liberty to individuals is that they may do what they please. We ought to see what it will please them to do before we risk congratulations, which may be soon turned into complaints. Before we congratulate them on their freedom, let's see what they do with it. For Burke, liberty and servitude are closely related. Without virtue in the person and in society, liberty devolves first to license and likely then to authoritarian restraint and all the horrors that follow with it. As he wrote, quote, in some people, I see great liberty indeed, and many, if not the most, an oppressive, degrading servitude. But what is liberty without wisdom and without virtue? It is the greatest of all possible evils. It, it, for it is folly, vice, madness, with, without tuition, without restraint. Those who know what virtu virtuous liberty is cannot bear to see it disgraced by incapable hands on account of their having high-sounding words and, uh, and in their mouths. And then a little later in the same paragraph, he said, to make a government requires no great prudence. Settle the seat of power, teach obedience, work is done. To give freedom is still more easy. It is not necessary to guide. It only requires letting go the reign. But to form a free government, that is to temper together these opposite elements of liberty and restraint and one consistent work requires much thought, deep reflection, and a sagacious, powerful, combining mind. This I do not find in those who take the lead in the French National Assembly. Ordered liberty then being a fragile achievement, the misuse of political authority, or even our liberty, threatens the trust in which political power is held for the good of all. As he wrote famously in a little, a later in life in a letter to a member of the National Assembly, quote, Men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that, quote, it's a famous phrase, that, quote, men of intemperate minds cannot be free, their passion forge their fetters. Men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passion forge their fetters. Self-restraint is what denies ordered liberty for Burke. What defines Self-restraint is what defines ordered liberty for Burke. Only in this way can we truly be liberated from what he calls unregulated will. <clears throat> As we gain mastery over our inner passions, we progress toward true freedom, and importantly, the need of control from without is vastly diminished. diminished and that, in turn, increases our political freedom. All right, eight, last and short. <clears throat> Burke's campaign against a uh, total revolution reminds us that society is a contract, not a contest. Right? A contract, not a contest. And we must always rise to its generational obligations. <clears throat> As we discuss, Burke at every turn opposed abstractions. For him, the natural rights school of thought was a principal offender in this way, with its abstract assertions and ahistorical social contracts. He did not share much in common with Locke or Thomas Jefferson, who did not believe in generational obligations. Burke, rather, put forward his own view of what makes up and sustains a genuine social contract. Or, as he put it more interestingly for our day, a generational partnership. He calls it a partnership, not social contract. He says, society is indeed a contract. As he sets it up and move away. It is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a, quote, a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. That's his idea of the social contract. Partnership between generations, between those who are living, those who are dead, and those are to be born. Each contract of a particular state is but a, is but a clause in the great primeval, primeval uh, contract of eternal society, linking the lower with the higher natures, connecting the visible and the invisible world, 
according to a fixed compact sanctioned by the inviolable oath which holds all physical and moral natures, each in their appointed place. Our, social, our political social obligations are binding one with each other and across generations. Burke's politics puts an emphasis on inheritance and not abstract liberty and choice. The present we inhabit, uh, we inhabit is just one link in a great chain of ordered liberty, of eternal order, a great chain of eternal order. <clears throat> Yuval Levin again shows that Burke believed we did not owe the future freedom, but rather we owed it the accumulated wisdom and work of the past. The task of any generation is to preserve and where necessary and, and possible improve what the generation has been given by its predecessors with the aim of passing the benefit along to its successors. Each generation must live with a sense of its own time as transitory, more or less the opposite of an eternal now. The opposite of an eternal now. It's not all about us. Signs are everywhere of the fraying of our cultural fabric and the degree to which our historic tradition of manners and the beliefs, practices, and institutions they fostered and supported have degraded and are, uh, to dangerously low levels of individual and cultural commitment. To escape that eternal now is our imperative, as it always is. We do so to meet the needs, our needs, the needs of our fellow citizens, and especially that we might better make the wisdom of the past available to each generation. In particular, <clears throat> those among the rising generation that uh, annually arrive, and many of whom are in this room, at educational institutions like Providence, Providence College. We do so because by having access to those achievements and making them new and fresh and alive for each generation, making them live for each generation, we can chart a better future for America and its constitutional order today and for those yet to be born. This is the ultimate reason to read Burke and others in the great tradition of Christian and conservative humanism, those who provide guidance, instruction, wisdom, exemplar exemplary models and so our touchstones and perennial sources in our, for our own efforts to stem radical revolution and renew, renew culture. Thanks. We have about 10 to 15 minutes for discussion, and it's our tradition to offer the first question, if possible, to a student. And if you would, just let me bring you the mic so we can record uh, your questions. Thank you again for coming to speak with us today. Um, so I remember at the kind of beginning of your talk that you mentioned a lot about Burke's family life and his uh, Catholic education. Um, what in particular about his Catholic education, maybe like his Thomistic and Augustinian education, do you think influenced his um, political philosophy, just overall outlook? Well, those were the, uh, <clears throat> I think they, were, they basically it was a formation because it was, he was six to 12 when he was in the hedge school, right in that period of time. So you know how that, that is. Those are basically uh, pre pre preparation for higher studies uh, in his Quaker you know, uh, school where, where he was first really introduced to the classics. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, they're, 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 the readings then uh, at that time were pretty, you know, they were diff different than ours, but there was a lot of poetry. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of or oratory, uh, oratorical um, conversation. The, um, he lived a bit, it was a very Gaelic, you know, life he lived. And so he, the, the education is kind of, I would maybe just say kind of bardic uh, a lot. You know, their talk that um, they, they, they were remembering telling stories, reciting the, some, some of the histories and the literature and the poetry of, of, of that region in particular. I've seen, um, and there's, there's some evidence in that. People have kind of studied some of the bardic tradition. It's hard because it wasn't all written down, obviously, but it's or, it, was, it, was, it was oral. So the bards spoke, um, and that, that tradition was very alive. It got attenuated in the late 18th century and into the 19th century, where you started to write things down more and you know, sort of more the, the kind of schooling that we were, were more familiar with. Um, whereas that time, you know, for him and that area he read. So, it, that, so for him, I think it's, it's sort of, he, he always had, he spoke, you can tell by the pas passages you read and write, he's, he has this incredible flourish in style. I think a lot of that 
it, it comes from just being around really kind of um, you know amazing reciters of you know learning. Uh, I, they did they, they they did study they did they generate studies they did study uh, the, a number of the saints the lives of the saints things like that I've, I've seen. Um, but a lot of it was reading, writing, and memorizing. <coughs> so he was really memorizing a lot and hearing a lot. And it comes across when you write. He writes with such great flourish. I mean, he's one of the great stylists. You can read Burke and just. Yeah, there's all the political wisdom, in, but it, but it's also one of the, he's he's considered one of the great he's considered I consider him I'm not the, all alone I mean you know the, think of him sort of like the Shakespeare of politics you know he's just a gorgeous writer you, once you get in involved I mean you may have to get used to because we're not used to those long florid sentences in a sense but but you can hear that you know but you can hear that way <laughs> that the, that the, the Irish may you know kind of kind of spoke to one another and, and thought um, so I think I think that's that's a big part he never lost his talking with Raymond, he never lost his strong Irish brogue. You'd think he would have. Uh, he could have easily, um, like a lot of Southerners, when they come uh, north in, in America, they, they get rid of the, they flatten out their accent so they can seem more like with the mainstream culture. It would have behooved him to do that because they made fun, because being, a, being an Irishman in England was always a, uh, you know, kind of underdog proposition. You're always kind of viewed as kind of a hayseed, you know, kind of this guy from the country, not that, you know, not, not serious and kind of a hick. And, uh, and, uh, and, and Americans were viewed that way too, uh, and, and colonists were viewed that way. So uh, from the British, so, so that's, that's something I think, uh, it's kind of it, the interesting that he might have had incentive to, you know, make his way in, in society to kind of soften his brogue, he didn't. He, and he had a very, very distinctive uh, accent still. Well, his Irishness, I think, yeah. I think, I think you know, the usual schoolboy, you know, things at that time, reading, general reading and writing and, and reading uh, the lives of the saints and other class. They read Plutarch, and I, I remember seeing that at the upper level. They were reading, they were reading Plutarch. Um, so, you, so it's a so sort of visual um, biographical line. But I think it's the, just that, just the bards. I mean, you know, what Homer was memorized, right? And they said it, but they, they had all that in their mind and that, those traditions are, are kind of lost now, but um, they, they were very, very alive with, uh, with him. Yeah. Uh, thank you, that was, <coughs> that was a great summary of Burke. Um, you know, when we think of Burke, we can't help but think of now, the revolution and his reaction to the revolution in France. Okay, that's obvious. Um, the other side of it, and I think most people paying attention to the news, um, when, when Queen Elizabeth II dies, if you paid attention at all, you saw a tremendous outpouring of, of sadness in the British population. You know, you got some people who didn't, but the vast, vast majority who did. And there's a way in which it's pretty obvious that they were not mourning the fact that she died only, right? She was 95 years old or something like that. She was going to die for some time or other. But rather the sense that with her passing, something was dying as well, something important to England. And I think part of the reaction would have had to be explained by the notion that they may never get it back. It may be something that is gone, that, that she takes to her grave, and there's no way back to it. Because um, I, I, I was thinking about that when you were, you were, you were quoting some of that tremendous passage of, of you know, his shock that when they went after the queen, um, the, you know, the, the French who were famous for defending the women, and especially women of this, of, of, of a high, of a, you know, important you know, status, didn't do anything. In fact, rather they celebrated, uh, at least some celebrated her decapitation in the, in the, in the, you know, in the public square. So I don't know, I, the, maybe you can, you can react to that, this notion that, um, which you would think in 2022 wouldn't exist, but it obviously did exist or does exist, that something is lost, you know, with something even as, as strange and peculiar as the English monarchy. <clears throat> well, I think it's also, uh, it's obviously part of the, what's the first thing they say when the queen dies? 
you know, I mean, it's continuity. That's uh, queen is dead, long live the queen, uh, king, right? It's not, 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 no disrespect to the dead, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's immediate sort of connect, generational connectivity. And that the, even in Britain, where you think, you know, they're far, farther uh, advanced in terms of their secularization and separation of, of religion from public life than we are. Um, I mean, we're kind of catching up, but they're still ahead. Um, you know, they still have these residual, you know, kind of, it's so deeply ingrained in the wisdom, the bank and cat, it's so into their, it's in their sinews, you know, this constitu the, the constitutional monarchy, it is, it they don't have much that, re that represents them anymore. <laughs> we don't have a lot that signifies us, that we, it, it gives us an identity. Our, our constitution is important to a lot of people because it's in a, in a land with no blood, with no soil or hereditary monarchy or whatever, we have a constitution that gives us, that gives us our identity pretty much. These documents are kind of our identity. Not only that, there's more than that. There's unwritten constitution, lots of things, but it's a big part of it. For them, still, with all the corruption and the silliness and the travesty of the, you know, the monarchy, they still somehow, by Vash and Lodge, react viscerally to the greatness of a person. First of all, everybody agrees that she's a great oak, you know, as they say, used to say, the sturdy oaks, they used to define the aristocrats as oaks. They were the great oaks of, and the sturdy oaks that kind of defined and held England together. And she was absolutely one of those, and the, that was com the rec recognized. So if there's a sadness, maybe it's a sadness that we won't, maybe we don't see that character again, a character is declining to some degree. But the generation is, you know, it's watering down, I guess. I'm not like an expert on like the pop stuff that goes on with the monast, but but my you know girls are you know crazy about the monast following it, so I pick it up. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I I think it's probably a sign of both. Look, we're always progressing and decaying at the same time. There's progress and you know decay and and different areas are happening, and while decay is happening all in the political institutions in Britain as they are here and the cultural decline. Um, I don't know. There's still there's still some you know things happening in in our in our space which we can talk about here and uh, and and evidently there where there's still some residual affection and deep commitment to their own particular tradition that they're not given up on just yet. So I think that that's probably less. As, maybe it's a sign of, that it's not what it was or what it could be or should be, but that it's there and it kind of seems there. It's not going anywhere probably as long as we live. Um, that maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's, maybe they're an unexpected, I mean, Burke always believed in history was just unexpected, a series of unexpected accidents. You just never know. You can't, you can't have a linear view of history because you just don't know when Joan of Arc's gonna happen or when Hannibal's gonna happen or when, you know, when a hobbit's gonna pop up. So uh, you just don't know. Um, so, but it happens. And so maybe in Britain, you know, just keep holding on, holding on, holding on, and all of a sudden there's a big renewal. That's what I'd hold out for. I mean, there there was an Augustinian. Everybody thought Rome was going, and there was an Augustinian, boom, a, a revival. So maybe there's an Augustinian age left for Anglo-Americans. We have time for one more question, there I think. There were some student questions up there, Gregory. Yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe we'll try to get a couple in. Yeah. Before I do that, let me just um, remind you all that we have our usual reception in the great room just down the hall when we're done. Please take a minute to stop by to continue uh, our conversation. I had with a textual and kind of conceptual question, um, which kind of might require you know speculating, interpreting what uh, what Burke might say, right? The simplest uh, kind of form is uh, what would Burke say to Rawls, <laughs> right? Uh, but also Burke is uh, is somewhat early, and I'm wondering uh, what whether there's a concept of like a Viberian uh, nation state uh, within within Burke. And whether he really wants to kind of intervene on that debate, and the reason I'm kind of thinking about that is because Rawls, you know, pretty much the Aquinas of of of, of um, uh, a modern kind of American legal theory for 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 quite a while, right? Is it would say all is welcome in Rawls's church because, uh, well, t uh, 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 you're you're kind of thinking of effectively private virtue and and communitas, right? Uh, and so within my kind of view of, of like the, the veil of ignorance and so on, this is completely compatible. Your, your views well, you, you know more about that than I do. I'm not a, a Rawls guy. I mean, I had, I, back when in college, I had a little section of them in a, cl in a class, so I, I can't I vaguely, you know. Yeah. But, I, but I mean, I, yeah. the abstraction, the abstracting of abstractions of st abs uh, nature of his thinking, drawing, I think would drive Burke to, his, the abstractions would drive him to distraction. <laughs> 
I think, I think, yeah, that, I don't think he would, you know, I, I, I think it would take him, you know, a step or two to get to his kind of liberalism and what he's offering versus what Burke is maybe thinking. Um, but I think, I think they're two very di wildly different thinkers, right? So maybe not. Yeah, yeah, no, no, he's not. He's not. Pri he's not privatizing this. No, he's saying. He's he's just t saying they're 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 direct. They're connected. The, the, the two, the private and the public, are absolutely connected. He's 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 a British politician through his whole life. He's he's a statesman. He's he's a he's a politician. To act. There's not that many politicians. Maybe you guys can figure this out as one of your actions in your game. How many how many politicians, real active politicians, you know, are uh, you know, kind of still red and at, at, at in a canonical level. Oh, there's some that have like little track. I mean, I could think of a couple here and there and not exactly the same way that Burke, but you might think a couple, but not many. <coughs> and there's, old, there's an old saying that uh, there's nothing deader than dead politics. You know, we think all this, uh, so much is dead, all this stuff is so great and it's so perennial, so, but it passes so fast and it's it become so stale and it's so antique and nobody pays, it's gone. It, it's a fly of summer, as Burke would say. So, um, so, Burke is exceptional for being a lifelong pol party politician, mainly in a, a, a opposition, <coughs> um, and uh, who is who wrote, who's considered a canonical political thinker. His aesthetic, his, his aesthetics are studied. His speeches are studied for rhetorical, you know, uh, education. I mean, he's just it's it's, it's pretty incredible. He's pretty almost almost abs almost unique, absolutely. Rot lock at a tiny little. Uh, position in government, but it wasn't anything significant. You could say that maybe Churchill wrote some histories and stuff, but they're not, I mean, they're not uh, nowhere near the, uh, they're interesting, but they're not at anywhere near the level of, of Burke's writing, who's considered, you know, on, on the, on the class, uh, in the canon. So, I don't know, I, th I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you said that Burke was educated at Trinity College in Dublin and that he was like well versed with like Latin and you know just like he, he believed that manners were like the um, foundation of society. So do you think he was so anti-revolutionary because most revolutionary causes were for people who are lower in society and not as well versed and possibly like edu and educated as uh, Burke was? Well. Almost the opposite is true. He was his lifelong defender of, of the downtrodden, the oppressed, the lower classes. I mentioned India. The Indians were brutalized, savaged by the East Indian Company and Warren Hastings. It's really ugly. He was a one-man band on the entire, and the only man alone, everybody thought he was crazy, would destroy his reputation. It did destroy his reputation. Ten years, he chased after Warren Hastings, who was a war criminal, basically. And he was, what was he doing? He was at the height of British society. He was most, one of the most respected men in British society. And all these little nabobs and innocent Indian, uh, in, 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 uh, Indians were being wiped out. Uh, and it was only Burke who came to their fence and said, this is an injustice, this is a violation of nature, this is arbitrary will, it is worse. He went to war for them. Uh, Irish, it was the 90, his Catholic relatives, they were 80% to 90% of cat were Catholic. They lived in dung hills, you know, dung hill, you know. They lived in, they lived in squalor. Their property was stole from them. <coughs> they were uh, treat, downtrodden every step of the way, and he was their absolute champion all the way. He helped them as soon as he got to London in the 1760s, write relief legislation. As soon as he could in Parliament in the 1780s, he pushed through uh, relief for those people, and it was the downtrodden, it was the 80% who were, who were absolute the lowest of the lowest. Even in American, in American colonies, he defended a, a lot of the, of the lower classes. He wasn't defending um, Ben Franklin's life, although he's friends with Franklin, actually, there or whatever. I mean, he was there. There's lots of evidence in his speeches where he talks about Native American. Oh, he wrote a, an account of the European settlements in America with his uh, kinsman uh, named Wilbur, no relation, um, in the 17 uh, late 1790s. It's really quite something, where he spends a great amount of time talking about, I guess, you know, Mare Indians, Natives people, complete defense of the Natives people against the Europeans. Slaughters. Um, he he uh, he takes in his histories. He wrote an abridgment of European uh, of of, uh, of history. David Hume had written a, a, a famous history of England. Burke thought he'd make his way and write one too, and he did. He wrote a beautiful one, by, but it never got published for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, early on, but it should have. Lord Acton thought it was one of the best things ever written on history. But all its its historical episodes, because he defends one after another. And Burke was the greatest defender of the downtrodden, the oppressed. He hated, if there was anything to define Burke's life, it was a hatred of arbitrary power. 
uh, where brutalizing the innocent. Um, that's not what the French Revolution thing was about. He was, in, in fact, the French Revolution was wiping out. I mean, look at the, in, in any of the regions where the French were wiping out, what were they, who were they wiping out? They were wiping out uh, Catholic peasants, village after village after village. He was horrified. He wasn't just defending the queen because you know he was uh, just up there defending privileged guys or women. Um, it was he was uh, he was outraged at every step of the way, whether it was Ireland, India, France, and even to some degree America. Well, it was America if you had taken into account his early writings on the Indians. <coughs> so, I'm not trying to push back on you, although I'm just I want to clarify that so you don't walk away with that view because actually Burke's more be more maybe your kind of guy than you think. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon, and please join me in thanking our speaker.